At Mercy Village Church, we are loving, abiding, and going. That's how we state our core values concisely. But each of those three core values is stated in its own robust sentence that gets at the fuller meaning. So in this sermon series titled Roots and Fruits, we're examining each of our core values and the why and the what behind each one. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you if you know this artist. Uh, her na- I'll tell you her name, and then I'm going to show you a picture. Let's see if you know who she is, and I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. So the name is Carolyn Davidson. Is anybody okay? Now, it's some of you, maybe if you're more artistically inclined, maybe you're familiar with that name. But I, if I, unless I miss my guess, most of you do not know the artist uh, uh, Carolyn Davidson. And I'll show you a picture, and that may not help much either. Anybody? No. Okay. Now I will show you her work. You you know her work. One hundred percent guarantee. You know her work. There's no doubt in my mind. You know her work. Am I right? Yeah. Billions of people know her work. She got paid $35 for that work. $35. And it has been reproduced millions and millions and millions of times. And that brand is worth over $20 billion. It's insane. Here she is now. This is her. Look at, there's the original design. The little sketch up there on the right. They finally gave her some stock in the company. And they gave her a Nike ring with a giant diamond right in the middle of it. So she got a little, a little compensation. But she was paid for what her price. It wasn't like she was underpaid. That was the price she quoted them. She did her design work. She put it forward. And that's her. Now I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. There's, today we're going to talk about our third core value. So we're in a series called Roots and Fruits. We're talking about the core values, the things that we value most at Mercy Village Church, and we're on the last of those three. And it is written like this. We are empowered by the Holy Ghost, and we will go outward boldly. Now, I'm going to refresh you on what they all are, because I want you to see something. I want you to see that our core values are triune triune in nature. Watch what I mean. This was number one. We spent the first three weeks on this one. We are loved by God, God the Father, And we will love God, God the Father, fully and love people selflessly. Core value number two, we are invited by Jesus, God the Son, and we will abide with him, with Jesus, communally. God the Father, God the Son, and of course today, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, by the the Holy Ghost, and we will go outward boldly. All three of our core values are rooted in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in what he has done, in what he is doing, and in what he he will do. And today, as we move to the Holy Spirit, I'm reminded of Carolyn Davidson, uh, because she was someone who, who didn't quite get the credit that she deserves. And what we'll see today, as we go to John chapter 16, is that the essential power of the Holy Ghost belongs to the children of God for the glory of Jesus. And so there is, by design, a way in which the Holy Spirit fades into the background. And Jesus gets the glory. We'll see that today. That, 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 is, that is the Holy Spirit, one of the priorities of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit, is that Jesus will get the glory. But also, if we forget about the Holy Spirit... If we forget about the work of the Holy Spirit, if we neglect the work of the Holy Spirit, um, then there is trouble in that way too. The redemptive plan of God the Father, accomplished through God the Son, is empowered by God the Holy Spirit by design. And his work is essential. So we'll see that today in John chapter 16. Father, what we know not today, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, Please give us, it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. John chapter 16 comes towards the end of the upper room discourse. That's what these chapters, chapters 14 through 17 in the book of John, 
are so frequently called. These are the last words or the last major discourse that Jesus will have with his disciples uh, forever. And it is the very last words he'll have before he dies. He'll say some more things after his resurrection, some very important things. But this, uh, these three chapters, 14, 15, 16, 17, these four chapters are the most expansive amount of dialogue that Jesus will have uh, before he returns to heaven. It actually gets kicked off in chapter 13 of John when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He's not speaking much yet, although what he is saying through that act is deafening. It's an incredible lesson that he gives to his disciples there, washing their feet. And then he begins to speak in depth, ad nauseum, in, in chapter 14. And it's like drinking from a fire hose for the disciples. He is revealing things to them, new information, or things that he has mentioned in the past but hasn't elaborated on yet, and it is blowing them back, blow after blow after blow, word after word, sentence after sentence. And when we come to chapter 16, but I have said these things to you, Jesus uh, says, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks, where are you going? Uh, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. These first three verses show us the sorrow of loss. The disciples were engaging the sorrow of loss. Jesus has told them so many things so far, but they are engaging two things primarily, that Jesus is going away and that suffering is, is coming. That the kingdom is not going to look the way they thought it was going to look. That the kingdom is not going to be established in the way that they thought it was going to be established. So they're losing a little bit of their dream, a little bit of their expectation, and they're about to lose one of their very best friends. But Jesus is reasoning with them here as to why he's telling them all these things. He says, first, I want you to remember something. Last words, right? Like when your kids maybe leave the house, my dad would always say is, remember whose you are. He would say that if I was going away to camp or something, remember whose you are. It's important that you remember that because you're a bokel and you bear the bokel name as you go, which many of you know is not worth much, but it was worth something. So as you go, Remember who you are. Jesus says, I want you to be able to remember these things. And then he explains why he hasn't said it yet. He says, I've waited until this time because now I'm actually leaving. And there's a certain weight that comes with final words. There really is. You can look on the internet for people's final words. M most importantly, if you have experienced the death of a loved one or a friend or someone close to you, there's poignancy in those last moments that you share together. Those last things. That they say, and so he says, I've waited till now to give you these final words. But he does mention something to them. He's not chiding them per se, but he but he is calling them out. He says, You you've yet to really ask me where I'm going. Now he obviously doesn't mean they haven't asked at all, because Thomas had just asked Jesus where he was going before, but he says, You're focusing on the wrong thing. You're trying to process the so the sorrow of me leaving, I get that. You're trying to process the, the death of this dream that you have of the kingdom being established now in, in this political way that you had expected it to be established, but you're not thinking about the benefits of me going to the Father. And because of that, sorrow is filling your hearts because your perspective is wrong. You're not digging into the right thing. Of all the things I've told you, you're not digging into the right thing. But notice I said he wasn't chiding them aggressively or harshly. Because one of the key points that, that Jesus has made, there's twofold to it. Yes, he's telling them things like um, there's going to be betrayal, Judas. There's going to be denial, Peter. There's going to be trouble in this world coming and, and hatred and persecution and even death coming. He had said that in, in right before the verses we're focusing on today. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. 
They will put you out of the synagogues, right? Your, uh, your, your current religious practices are going to be cut off by the religious rulers. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you... What? Wait a second. I didn't sign up for that. When whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. That's how messed up the world is going to be towards you. They're going to think they're serving God and killing you, and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. So he says, all this is coming. Boom, 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 boom. But another thing he has done is he has continued to comfort them. He has said to them uh, things like, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm preparing a place for you. Greater things are coming. You will not be left as orphans. I'm leaving my peace with you. He says a second, says it twice in the discourse, let not your hearts be troubled. He says your joy will be full. And once again, Jesus does the same thing. He comforts them. In verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Verses 4 through 6 are are the sorrow of loss. Verse 7 is the promise of gain. That in this loss of their friend and in this death of this dream that they've had of how, again, remember, think, that they thought that Jesus was going to be a king who sat on a throne and ruled and reigned and delivered them from Rome. That's what they wanted. Right? So they're having the death of that dream all through Jesus' ministry and now kind of culminating the death of that dream. And the loss of their friend, the sorrow of loss, and into it, though, is the promise of gain. He says the, the helper. The word here is paraclete. If you have a different translation than the ESV, you may see counselor, you may see comforter, you may see helper. It's often translated those ways because each of them kind of get to an idea of what that Greek word means. There's a Greek word there that's hard for us to sum up in an English word because of the way that, that all of our English words carry all this different meaning to them. So if you think of counselor, you might think of uh, someone who is like a school counselor. But the Holy Spirit's role is one of, like, legal counsel. He defends. He prosecutes. We'll see that, that he convicts people of things. There's also the idea of a comforter, right? But not like a, a comforter that you maybe uh, wear as a blanket or even a comforter that just kind of tells you everything is going to be okay, but a comforter who reminds you of the promises of God and in reminding you comforts your soul. And he also is a helper, Right? But not in some submissive, subordinate way, right? but in a, the way a parent would help a child. As a superior, stronger, greater uh, uh, force, he enters into our lives humbly, gently, lovingly, helping us along as we follow Jesus. So it's all of those things in that word, paraclete, uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit. And so he comforts them by saying, when I leave, this is the plan, there will be someone else who will come. And notice what he says. He says it's to your advantage that I leave. It's actually going to be better for you that Jesus is not here physically and in real, and in real uh, form, human form. That's a bold claim, but it's not the first he's made. Look at this one, chapter 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Okay, we're fine so far. Yeah, we'll be like Jesus. He'll, he'll make us more and more like him. But then he says, and greater works than these will he do. Because I am going to the Father. Wait a second. Doesn't that sound sacrilegious at first? Well, understand, he doesn't mean greater in power. He means greater in scope. So imagine throwing a rock into a pond. What is the most powerful splash? The very first one. It's the greatest in power. But as the ripples go out, which one will be the greatest in circumference? The final one. That's the idea. That this is going to explode, right? When Jesus is dead and buried and raised from the dead, this whole thing is going to explode like a bomb in the water. And Jesus' death and resurrection will be the most powerful part. But the widest reach of it is still yet to be seen as it carries out to every tribe and tongue and nation. You're part of the fulfillment of that promise. That the Holy Spirit 
has brought conviction into your heart and life and saved you when you are part of God's family. The growing ripple effects of what Jesus did. Greater things are coming. It is to our advantage that Jesus goes away. So he tells them this as the promise of gain. Jesus will die. This was the prophecy from the Old Testament. This was the promise of the Messiah that he would die, be buried, raised from the dead, and then be ascended into heaven where he sits at God's right hand. And until that prophecy was fulfilled, the next step couldn't come. And so Jesus says, I have to go. I can't stay. I must go. So into their sorrow of loss comes the promise of gain, and it's the promise of the the Holy Ghost, of his comforting presence and of his power. Now Jesus begins to describe his work. He's going to do it in three ways. We'll see uh, real quick. He's going to do convicting. That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit is convicting, conveying, brings light to things, and he, uh, he's convicting, he's conveying, and he's, he's glorifying. Verse 8 says this, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and, and judgment. Now this is an outline for the next three verses. This is an outline for the next three verses, which are talking about the Holy Ghost work of convicting the world. Now in particular, he's talking to those who are lost and far from God. Those who are not Christians when he speaks of the world. Those who are still in the world, those who are apart from Christ, this is the Holy Spirit's work for them. And he goes through and he he ticks them off one by one. He says in verse 9, concerning sin, so he's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. The primary sin that he will convict the world of is not believing in Jesus. That they don't believe he is who he says he was. That they don't believe he is. it was the fulfillment to all the promises that were made. He will convict the world of sin. And so that's his first operation. That's his first thing. The message of the cross is, is foolishness to those who are perishing, Paul will say. And so for those, of, of those who are not in Christ, the message of Jesus is foolishness. The Holy Ghost comes along and begins to convict us of that sin. That short-sightedness, that lack of knowledge, convicting us of the sin of not believing in Jesus. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Now this is a little bit more complex, because the word convict is applied to all of them in verse 8. He's going to convict us of sin, and when we think of the word convict, we think rightly so, because that's the way it's used here, of uh, convincing someone of something being absolutely 100% true. So if he's convicting the world of their sin, then how could he be convicting the world of their righteousness? Well, if you dig deeper, not just into the word usage, but into the context of it, and the, and the work of the Holy Spirit being to carry forth the work of Jesus, then you can think about it like this. Jesus, part of his ministry, was to convict the people around him, in particular the religious leaders, of their self-righteousness, of their false righteousness, that their standard of righteousness was wrong. And that's the work here. He's convicting the world of their self-righteousness. You think you can make yourself right with God. You think you can make yourself good. You can't. He convicts of self-righteousness. And then concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. He says, I'm going to convict those who are sinners and self-righteous that there is judgment coming. And that judgment will be for them the same as it was uh, for the ruler of this world, who is Satan. That's a big deal. That's a harsh one. And so this is the work of the Holy Spirit for those who are lost and far from God. By the way, If you're here today and you're a Christian, this is the work he did in your life at one point. He convicted you of your sinfulness, that you could not make yourself righteous before God. He convicted you of the judgment that awaited you. He revealed those things to you in your heart and in your life. And then he pointed you to Jesus. And you saw the finished work of Jesus as sufficient for the forgiveness of your sin. This work was done for you, and it's a work that the Holy Spirit continues to do in the lives of those who do not know Christ. 
Now he transitions back to the Holy Spirit's work among us. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So he says, I get that it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? You've, I've said so, you've heard so much from me. I've said so much, and we're running out of time, so I'm not going to say it all. You're not ready to hear it all. But just because Jesus will be absent does not mean that they will not continue to learn these things. He says in verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, new nickname for the Holy Spirit, a good one to remember. He's the spirit of truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. Verses, verse 13 shows us the Holy Spirit's work of illuminating. He illuminates the truth. This isn't the first thing Jesus has said about it. The Holy Spirit gets a lot of press in the upper room discourse, if you haven't noticed. But the helper, again that word paraclete, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance what I have said to you. This is important. All of this is important, especially as we, I think, in, at least in the circles I came up in, the neglect of understanding of the Holy Spirit. This is a direct statement to what he does for the children of God. In particular, what he will do for the disciples in the days and weeks and years to come, but, in, in, but also what he does for all of the children of God. He reveals new things Teaching Now, not new things in the timeline, new things to us, right? Like you will buy, if you buy a used car, you still will tell people you got a new car. It doesn't mean it's a brand new car, but it's new to you, okay? So the, the things of Jesus are the same, uh, the truth about Jesus is the same. It, it doesn't change. There's no new additions to it. It's still the same. But for those who are believing, those who are new Christians, these things are new to them. And what the Holy Spirit does is he takes the blinders off of our eyes so that we can see new truth about Jesus. And that's a lifelong pursuit for the Christian. To continue to learn more about his humility. To continue to learn more about his forgiveness. To continue to learn more about his patience, his gentleness. To learn those things lifelong pursuit. The Holy Spirit brings new information, but he also brings remembrance. So he's helping illuminate truth in two ways. New things that we've yet to learn as Christians, he helps us to understand them for the first time. And then when we're prone to wander, when we're prone to forget the promises and the work and the words of Jesus, he reminds us of them. He says, don't forget, in this moment of your anger, Jesus' words about anger. In these moments of impatience, in these remembering the truths about Jesus. And so that is his work of illuminating. Additionally, and it's, it's really just a part of this, John says in verse, uh, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 15, but when the helper comes who I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. That's another way he's illuminating truth is that he continues, right, through, through teaching and reminding to bear witness to who Jesus is. But get this, and you also will bear witness, children of God, because you have been with me from the beginning. To me, this is so cool because even when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to, to telling others about who Jesus is, bearing witness to who he is, it's a team project. The Holy Spirit must be with us in our sharing of the gospel. Because as the Holy Spirit bears witness to who Jesus is in us, we bear witness to who Jesus is to those around us. The Holy Spirit is his witness, and we are his witnesses. The Holy Ghost is at work consistently proclaiming the gospel to us and through us. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's teaching us, reminding us. It's that still, small voice, that nudging inside of us. It's that, it's that moment when, as we're reading the Word of God, something clicks for us for the very first time. Oh, I see that now. 
It's that time when we're about to maybe go in a direction we shouldn't go and we remember a promise from Scripture or we remember something that we've learned about Jesus and it, and it holds us up, it stops us. Or when we're with someone and they're in, in sorrow and in grief and we don't know what to say and God reminds us of something, a promise that he has made and we're able to share that with the people there. That's the work of the Holy Spirit teaching, illuminating the truth. But you can also go back to the last point and see how what he does for unbelievers, even in his illuminating, he's still continuing to do for believers. That as we know more about Jesus, we're not convicted of sin in the same way we were at the very beginning of our salvation, when we realize I am separated from God. We don't have to realize that anymore because it's no longer true of us as children of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We don't need convicted in sin of that way, in that way. But we still need to be reminded of what it looks like to live righteously. And so as, G as the Holy Spirit teaches us the way of Jesus, reminds us of the truth about Jesus, we learn to walk more and more in holiness. We don't need convicted... Uh, we don't need convicted of our own self-righteousness in the way that we originally were as non-Christians. Because before you think you got it, that you can do it, that you can get, you know, earn your way or figure it out on your own, and then Jesus reveals to you, or the Holy Spirit reveals to you, no, Jesus must be your righteousness. But we still must continue to grow to have self-righteousness die in our lives. We won't be judged. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We won't be judged. But the judgment of non-believers to come should encourage us and inspire us to go and proclaim boldly the gospel to others. He's still doing that same work in us, convicting of sin, convicting of self-righteousness, convicting of judgment, even for the children of God. He continues to guide us into truth. And we gracefully proclaim and share the good news. So, it all culminates with this. Why is he doing everything that he's doing? Why is the Holy Spirit at work convicting? Why is the Holy Spirit at work illuminating? John goes on to tell us exactly why. He says, verse 14 and 15, our last two verses, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit's main objective is this, glorifying the Savior. All of his teaching, all of his reminding, all of his convicting, all of his illuminating is for the glory of Jesus. One of the Holy Ghost's main objectives is to glorify Jesus, to make Jesus famous. This matters. You can't attribute to him a desire other than his own. And if this is what Jesus says his desire is, then this is what his desire is. But it's not only the Holy Ghost that desires to make much of Jesus. God the Father does as well. D.A. Carson puts it like this. We are to understand that Jesus is the nodal point of revelation. In other words, the main uh, display, the main uh, reason, the, the focus of all of revelation, all the word of God. God's culminating self-disclosure. God's final self-expression. God's word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. All antecedent revelation has pointed towards him and reaches his climax in him. All the work of God the Father at one of his highest priorities in revealing uh, his truth to us is that Jesus would be glorified. Now the spirit of truth leads the disciples into all the implications of the truth, the revelation intrinsically bound up with Jesus Christ. There is no other locus of truth. This is all truth. Here's the point of all that. God the Father is at work to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work to glorify Jesus because in Jesus is redemption and salvation for mankind. And God's plan is redemptive. That he would bring for himself people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Good litmus test, by the way. When people say that the Holy Spirit is at work and, and you're looking around, what does that mean? If it's not bringing glory to Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. Right? The, the, the Holy Spirit is not just about goosebumps and shivers. 
The Holy Spirit is about the glory of Jesus. And if Jesus is not being glorified, then whatever's happening is not of the Holy Spirit. But on the other side, and this is important too, it is impossible for us to truly glorify Jesus without the Holy Spirit. And so to neglect and forget and act as if, right? I, and again, I grew up in places where the Holy Spirit is almost like, we don't even want to talk about that weird thing. It's the Holy Spirit. Oh, I don't want to get any goosebumps. What's that all about? I don't want that. We must have the Holy Spirit at work in us if we will bring any glory to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work for the glory of Jesus, and it is a worthy cause. Revelation 5, 1 through 5, John wrote these words as well. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Jesus, or John has gone into the future in a dream. He's seen the end of all things, the consummation of all things. Jesus is going to say, I'm making all things new. And John is on board for that. John has suffered. John has seen how hard this world can be and how, uh, how deadly sin can be. And John is looking forward, as all of us should be, to the day when Jesus makes everything right. And as it's on the precipice of happening, there's a scroll that's held up with seven seals and in it, is the culmination, the consummation of all things. And, and I saw the mighty angel proclaim with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And John began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to look into it. And one of the elders said to him, Weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. This is why he is worthy. Verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders and voices of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus is worthy. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us to bring glory to Jesus. That is his primary work. That is his magnum opus. That is his crowning achievement, bringing glory to Jesus. And the crux of his worthiness is this. He died for sinners so that we can be made right with God. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, Jesus died for you so that you could have your sins forgiven. He gave his blood on that cross. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus, God's Son, washes away all of our sins. You can have your sins cleaned away today through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not complicated. You believe you can't because the Holy Spirit has convicted you of your self-righteousness and your sin today. And you believe that Jesus did and what he did was enough. And if the Holy Spirit is at work in you revealing that to you today, then all you have to do is respond in faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Child of God, what do we do with this? <laughs> it's a weird verse right here. But it's the point I want to make. Be filled with the Spirit. This is Paul's words to the church at Ephesus. He says, do not get drunk with wine. Some of you are like, oh man, quarantine's been hard. <laughs> well, you can say you can't have it. Just don't, just don't get drunk. For that is debauchery. It's a million dollar word. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so what does that look like? And then I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. If you have more questions about it, we can, we can talk about it. But, but let me say it this way in light of what we just, what we just studied. In Romans 8, 5, Paul says those who live according to the Spirit do what? Set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So if that's true, then what are the things of the Spirit? 
Well, what we just saw is that the things of the Spirit are revelations and teachings and reminders about who Jesus is. So what I'm saying today is that one of the primary ways that we are filled with the Spirit is to look at Jesus again and again and again and again. Paul goes on to elaborate in this same passage. I'm going to go to that first. He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is one of the ways that we become filled with this Spirit as we sing about Jesus. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gratitude is a pathway to being filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Unity amongst the body of Christ is a way of being filled with the Spirit. John Piper has this quote. He says, So drinking the Spirit means setting our mind on the things of the Spirit. And setting our mind on the things of the Spirit means directing our eager attention to the teachings of the apostles about Jesus and to the words of Jesus. And I would add to the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. Drink that in. And if we do this long enough, it's a weird way to talk, but he's just using the way Paul talked. We'll get drunk with the Spirit. <laughs> Don't think, Christ, it's not me. Everybody's going to roll around on the floor and start laughing. It means that we are going to begin witnessing about Jesus. We're going to talk about him. We're going to live like him. We're going to look like him. That's what it'll look like when we're filled with the Spirit. In fact, we will get addicted to the Spirit, to walking in that place where we are constantly remembering and learning and knowing Jesus. Instead of chemical dependency, will you develop a wonderful spirit dependency? One last way to be filled with the Spirit is pretty simple. <laughs> if then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You want to be filled up with the Spirit of, of the Holy Spirit, ask God for that. So don't think of this in some weird, mystical, goosebumpy way. Think about the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you, know, you will. Some people will experience this differently, right? Some of us, when we have Jesus revealed to us, we weep. Like when we learn something new or we have some reminder of who Jesus is, we weep. Some of us will lift our hands. Some of us will have chills. Some of us will be stoic. I don't know. I mean, again, the responses will be different, but it'll be about Jesus and the revelation of who he is. So might we be filled with the Spirit? And then number two, I'd say believe the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit reminds you of, your, of the truth about Jesus, believe him. When he points out and convicts you of sin, believe him. When he reminds you that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, believe him. When he reminds you of the future promises of God, believe him. And then lastly, follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. Let's live our lives to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus. Let's live our lives bearing witness to Jesus. We'll get to that next week as we look at the fruit of this root. As we look at the Great Commission and what it looks like to go boldly. The essential power of the Holy Ghost belongs to the children of God for the glory of Jesus. So might we, Mercy Village Church and, and those from other churches, children of God, might we be people filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit, not for our glory, but for the glory of Jesus. And that'd be true about us. God, thank you so much that the Holy Spirit can do work that I didn't, can't do today. But because that's great. Because that means that no matter how well or not well I preach, no matter how well or not well we sing, Holy Spirit, you are at work among us, and we thank you for that. May we see Jesus, Father, we ask that we might see Jesus as beautiful, as sufficient, and as worthy of our very lives. And may we lean into the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to live like Jesus, to know Jesus, and to bear witness about Jesus. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray.
Thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.